Hey everybody, just another quick reminder before the message starts for today to talk about leadership. You know, we say at Nativity that everything rises and falls on leadership. The group that you're a part of right now, it would not be where it is but for the leader. Your leader is awesome, I'm sure. Now, all this talk about splitting groups or multiplying groups or have pe having people step away can be generally unpopular. But think of the incredible things that your leader has made possible for you and the other members of your group. Wouldn't it be awesome for you to make faith growth possible for other people and our church community as well? As you well know, leaders aren't perfect people, but they're just willing, willing to be used by God. So if you're willing to be a small group leader at Nativity, or if you're even just a little bit interested, head to our website, churchnativity.com slash smallgroups, and fill out the form online. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to week three of our series called Love Lives. During this series in small groups, we've been looking at the first letter of John and everything that John has to say about love, which is a lot. And so this week, uh, we're going to look at one of the obstacles to loving well. In week one, Tom said that one of the obstacles to loving others well is that we love the world too much. We love possessions and pleasure and power too much. And so this week, I'm going to look at one another obstacle that gets in the way of loving others well, and it's the biggest obstacle for me. So a few weeks ago, we were in our No Offense series, and in small groups, I talked about how the cross is really offensive to some people. It's offensive because it reminds us that we are sinners. It reminds us of the darkness of our hearts. The cross reminds us that because of our sin, a punishment had to be rendered, and that punishment was on Jesus. Some people don't want to hear that. Some people are offended by that. But as Christians, as Catholic Christians who want to follow Jesus, the cross should remind us of only one thing, and that is love. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for us. And the cross is a reminder of that great love. It's why we wear a cross around our neck or why we put a cross on the wall at home. It's why we have the crucifix hanging in the center of the sanctuary. It reminds us of his great love. And really the only response or reaction that we should have to that great love is to love others. But as we know, there are lots of obstacles that get in the way of doing that well. And so this week we're gonna look at one of those. I'm gonna jump right into the scripture. In 1 John chapter two, he says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. So I want you to just throughout this message, I want you to think about someone that you hate, someone that you dislike very much because I'm sure there's someone for all of us. So I just want you to keep that person in mind, someone who offends you or someone who you don't care for very much. Okay, so remember that the first letter of John was written to a group of people who had fallen away from the faith, a group of people who they just couldn't wrap their brains around the idea that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. And so they left the disciples. And it seems as though they were living a life that was immoral and they lacked practical love, but they were still claiming to belong to God. And so in this verse, in chapter 2, John is saying you can't claim to be in the light. You can't claim to love God, but then hate your brother or sister. And he's saying that to these men, that, that hate and love, are they're at odds against each other. You can't possibly do both at the same time. It implies that these men who fell away were, were living a life where they hated some other people or they were treating people poorly. You can't love God and hate your neighbor or your coworker or an ex-friend. You can't love someone or you can't love God and hate someone. Love and hate can't exist in the same heart. 
They cannot coexist together. And as I say this, I want to argue with John because I think I love God, but there's also some people I don't care for that much. I want to argue that point. Yeah, you can do both, right? Don't you? But John is saying here, you can't. You can't do both. You can't hate someone, a person, and love God at the same time. And so he takes it a step further. In chapter 4, John says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. So we cannot claim to love God but then turn around and fail to demonstrate that love to someone else, to our neighbor. John also indicates here that it's easier to love someone that we can see. And that's probably true. And so if we can't love the people that are right in front of us, then certainly we can't love a God that we can't even see. We're liars if we claim to do that. I feel like if we could just get this love thing right, if we just loved him, if we loved God as much as we say we do, as fiercely as we say we do, like we sing at church on Sunday, if we loved him as much as we say we do, then all else would flow from that love. The rest of our lives would be easier if we really loved him. But we don't know how to love very well, do we? I mean, it's easy to love like our kids or maybe sometimes our spouse or grandkids, or maybe it's easy to love our parents, maybe not sometimes. But there are certain times when it's really easy to love, right? Feels good. Everything feels good. I have that warm, fuzzy feeling. I feel good about you, so I love you. But there are other times when love is really difficult and we just don't do it. And I think part of our issue is that we don't really understand the true definition of love. Like, sure, we've all heard the idea that love is a verb and it requires action. I just think we don't really understand that very well. I think that's my problem anyway. The biblical definition of love says that it's sacrificial, that we sacrifice something for someone else. And there are people in our lives that we don't think are worth sacrificing for. That definition also says that it's a caring commitment. So that means that it's a commitment to love even when it's hard, even when we don't feel those good feelings anymore. And finally, the biblical definition of love says that we seek the highest good for the other person that we love. But this is really difficult to do sometimes. And there are obstacles to that. I read when I was preparing for this message that as John got older, he had to be carried in and out of church, the the weekly church meetings. And at the end of each meeting, he would give a brief word to all the people that were gathered. And he would always say the same thing. He would say, let us love one another. That's it. That's all he would say. And so some of the people were like, well, doesn't he have more advice to give? Like, is that the only thing that he can say? Why does he always say the same thing week after week? And John answered them. He said, because it is the Lord's command, and if it's the only thing we do, that is enough. If love is the only thing we do, it's enough. All right, I want to read one final passage from John. And I'm going to read the whole thing um, at once. And I want you to just pay attention and and listen to the verse and see what you notice. This is chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. Dear friends, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Did you catch that? John says love. He uses the word love 10 times in that short passage. 
10 times. And he repeats himself over and over again. Love one another. If you know God, then you will love others. If you don't love others, then you don't know God. He repeats himself and he uses the word love 10 times. Now, I feel like I know how the people of the ancient church felt. What, doesn't he have anything else to say? Give me some other advice. You're repeating yourself over and over. But I think he's doing that for a reason. He's saying that love is not an optional virtue. We have to love others in order to love God, in order to claim that we belong to God. We ought to love others because Jesus died for us out of that love. And so he repeats himself over and over to make sure that we understand that love is the distinguishing mark of the church. In John's gospel, he gives us Jesus' words. Jesus says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That means that people should be able to look at us and know that we belong to God because of how we love others. So how do we do that? What does this look like? Well, again, this biblical definition gives us some guidance. It should be sacrificial. It should, there should be action on our part. We should be sacrificing something selfish for the other person, for the person that we love. Again, that might be easy with our kids. And maybe you're thinking of the times that you've done it really well. But I want you to go back to that person that you dislike. Have you ever sacrificed anything for that person, your coworker or your neighbor that you don't particularly care for? And then the second part of the definition of love is that it's a commitment that even when we don't feel like it, we still treat them with love. Again, think about that person. And then finally, it seeks the highest good for that person, the person that we are trying to love. And so there's a big obstacle to this. It's that hate, it's that being offended. That's an obstacle for being able to do those three things, that sacrificial, committed love that seeks the higher good. And this is my biggest obstacle, that there are just people that I don't care for. There's not too many, but I can think of one in particular. There's this guy that lives in my neighborhood, and my neighborhood is very, very social, and he has kids my kid's age, and so I see him all the time, and I just don't particularly care for him. I find him offensive for a number of reasons that I won't get into. But this one particular time, I was at a party, and we were chatting. We were talking about football. It was in the fall, and I think the next night the Ravens were playing the Steelers because there was, we were talking about the Ravens and the Steelers. And I mentioned that I'm from Frostburg, and in Frostburg, everybody is a Steeler fan. Nobody in Frostburg are Baltimore fans. They're all Pittsburgh fans. And so I grew up as a Steeler fan, my dad and my brothers loved the Steelers. And I mentioned this to him. I say this to this guy. And he's a big Ravens fan. So he scoffs at me for being a Steelers fan. And in the process of scoffing at me, he actually spits in my face. That's right. Spit in my face. And I am so offended by this. I'm appalled that a 40-year-old man would spit in a woman's face. So I, I don't even remember what I did, but I leave this party and I hate this person. And so I go on to tell everyone this story, anyone that will listen, so that they can hate him too, because this is just not okay. And I just really don't like this person. But again, I see him. We have mutual friends. Our kids are the same age. I see him every week, a couple times. And I just hate him. Have I said that? Okay, so anyway, um, somebody mentions to me that maybe I should pray for him as a way to get past this. Now, if you're thinking of the person that you hate, your brother or your sister that you hate, your neighbor, your coworker, uh, an ex-friend, an ex-spouse, if you're thinking of someone you hate, you can imagine that praying for them is difficult. And maybe you're thinking, uh, no, I can't do that. And I thought that too. But I took that advice and I began to pray for him and it changes your perspective quite a bit. And so my first challenge for you this week in this series is to pray for the person that you dislike. The second thing I want to suggest is that you see that person face to face because the fact that I had to see this person face to face a couple of times helps me see that 
he's a human being. Like it's really easy to go behind someone's back and talk about them and hate them when you never see them. You can just, you can just really dislike them. But when you see someone face to face, you see their humanity. You understand that they're a human being that deserves to be loved just like you do. You understand that they're a human being with fl flaws like you and that Jesus died for them too. And so I'm not suggesting um, that you see someone who's abusive to you or who's extremely offensive all the time. You know, it's, it's okay to avoid people that are toxic to you. But if this is just someone that, that you don't like because of one incident that happened, I think it's helpful to see them face to face so that you can begin to move past the hate and understand and just see them and see their humanity. So pray for them. See them face to face. And then the third challenge I want to make for you this week is just to look at the cross differently. That when you look at the cross, that you see love. That you are reminded that God so loves you that he sent his son to sacrifice his life for you out of love. And the only reaction, the only response to that kind of love would be that you love others. That you love them sacrificially in a committed way and that you seek only the highest good for that person. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son, that while we were still sinners, you sent the Savior to die for our sins. Lord, I pray that you would help us move past our hatred, that we would deal with the hatred in our hearts by finding a way to love others, Lord, that you would help us do that. We pray that you would make it easy for us to pray for our enemies, and to love others. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.